Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. So with this episode, we are beginning part one of our book study, Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues, which just came out this year. This book is like the second plain child's version of The Good Shepherd and the Child, A Joyful Journey, which is for the level one child. And so Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues, is for the level two and the level three child. Now this episode, we have Rebecca Roitsevich, who is the author of the book on the podcast today, and she's going to be diving into chapter one and chapter two, which are both very short chapters that we are going to be discussing with her. And then next episode, I have Anna Hurdle, who will be diving into chapter three. Now, there are nine chapters in this book, and we are not doing all nine as the podcast's part in this book study. And that is on purpose because we kind of want to springboard you into doing this book study and to diving into this new book that we have available for you. Our hope is to be able to discuss each of these chapters on the podcast eventually. But at this moment, we just want to springboard you into a book study of this beautiful book with your friends, your neighbors, your fellow catechists, your fellow parent friends, with yourself, with the Holy Spirit, with whoever you feel comfortable doing this book study with. Back in March, we had Rebecca on the podcast and she discussed chapter seven with us, the moral life in the kingdom of God. So we do have that available for whoever wants to listen to it as well. I'll put a link to that episode in our show notes. Now on the website, the cgsusa.org website, we have a page specifically for this book study and it will have information about these few podcasts. We will also have a very unique book study format for you to print off and have available to you if you would like to do this book study in a group. The beautiful thing about podcasts are that you don't have to do it right now if this is not a good time or maybe you're not ready, you haven't ordered your book yet, but you can do it in a month or two months or next summer or throughout the school year or whenever it's a good time for you. So know that these resources are on our website available for you whenever you are ready to dive into this beautiful book. We also have a video that we recorded with a few beautiful catechist and formation leaders discussing the specific format of a book study that we are offering to you. It's a very unique format, diving into more of the heart of what the Holy Spirit is calling you to. So go check it out. Again, for today's episode, we have Rebecca, the author of Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues, diving into chapter one and chapter two with us. I hope you enjoy. Rebecca, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. I think it's a really unique experience that as we are starting this book study, we are going to be starting with the author of the book. I think that's really oh. unique and amazing. <laughs> we are so blessed to have you. Thank you. Well, Rebecca, these two chapters that we're going to be discussing, they're they're simple and beautiful, and there's so much that I highlighted in them. So I just want to dive into it with you. But before we do that, anybody who might not have listened to any of the other episodes that you've been with us on the podcast, would you just speak briefly into who you are and your involvement in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Sure. Um I've been a catechist of the Good Shepherd. Uh, this is my 40th year um, since I completed um, the two-year formation course with Sophia Cavalletti and John Nagobi in Rome, how blessed I was. I had been a Montessori teacher, um, a directress uh, for five years, so I already knew and loved the Montessori way of, of being with and helping children. Uh, so the um, Catechesis of the Good Shepherd was the icing on that cake. And I've been working with the children ever since. So this year, mm. I finished in Rome in 1981. So this comes up in 2021, my 40th year. Wow. Um, and I 
continue to be with children in the atrium of the Missionaries of Charity, but also at my parish, St. Patrick Catholic Church in Memphis. Wow. 40 years. That's beautiful. Yeah. I know. That's awesome. Well, okay, so just this year you've gifted us with this beautiful book, which is like the sequel to Joyful Journey. The Good Shepherd and the Child, A Joyful Journey. So would you speak briefly into how this book came to be in our hands? Right. Well, The Good Shepherd and the Child, A Joyful Journey, the first volume, um, had its origins in a, a bishop in Canada who loved the religious potential of the child three to six but felt that it was a little difficult for the average mm -hmm. lay person to just pick it up and plunge into it. Yeah. And ha after the work had gotten started in Canada, he had a particular request that there be another book which helped people to access the riches of religious potential. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Patricia Coulter took the lead on that. She worked with Sophia, with Silvana Montanaro and John Nagobi, and they put together a first edition of The Good Shepherd and the Child, A Joyful Journey. And it did prove to be very helpful, uh, not just to the average parent or layperson, but also as a support text in courses, level one mm -hmm. courses. Um, then we revised it just a few years ago and updated it because the catechesis is a living, growing thing. And mm -hmm. some things had come into sharper focus. So then when Sophia published The Religious Potential for the 6 to 12-year-old child, we knew uh, that a similar need would arise, that it, the riches of that book are so profound that there would need to be uh, a sort of companion volume that would underscore and help to make even more accessible the riches of religious potential. Mm -hmm. So about 13 years ago, uh, Sophia and I had a conversation and we decided that, yes, I would write uh, that second joyful journey. But as I've told you in a previous podcast, it took me a mere mm, seven, six, seven years to be able to even really begin it because I was mm -hmm. waiting for the right framework for it. The yeah. content of 6 to 12 is the atrium content for six to 12 child is so rich yeah and it, it could take a thousand pages to yeah. if if one were to just set out to explain or uh, delve into everything that we do with the six to 12 child um so I, I was waiting for the right framework and that was really only given to me by i consider by the holy spirit about five years ago and that was the mm -hmm. spiral method, which is mm. the chapter two in this book. And once I got that framework, then it became much easier to flesh it out. And mm -hmm. so I took particular delight in the end. I didn't set out to make it less than 100 pages, <laughs> knowing it could easily be a 1,000. But uh -huh. it felt like a particular gift to me when it was over that what I had been given was really very short compared to what mm -hmm. it could have been. And yeah. so um, so that's it. It's um, it was a long time coming. It was the fruit of all those years with the children and with the catechesis content and the religious potential. And then it came together through the miracle of community and helpers. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. I think that it's absolutely miraculous that you were able to take level two and level three content in such a concise book. I've always thought, especially level three, that by a time a child or an adult has worked through level three, it's like you've gotten a master's right. in theology. Yes. It's just that extensive, that much. And the fact that you have been able to hit the most essential 
of both these levels in such a concise, beautiful way in this book is nothing short of miraculous. You know, the shortness of it is also a reminder that we are not formed in this work. We are not formed as catechists through any book, Mm -hmm. but through an in-person formation experience that's quite involved, as you know, as well as experience with the children. Mm -hmm. So the book is, is not meant to be a substitute for either of those experiences, the formation course and especially for the life of the atrium itself. Right. It's meant to be almost an arrow to the children. Right. And to God that is revealed through the children. Yes. So in chapter one, we begin with the level one child. You begin by breaking up who that level one child is. Can you speak into why that is important Mm -hmm. in a book that is about the level two and level three child? Right. Well, for starters, it wasn't my brilliant idea. (laughs) It was uh, in trying for this book to be a companion to the religious potential of the child for the 6 to 12 child. Mm -hmm. Um, That's how Sophia began that book. Right. The chapter one was questions of the child. And she, before going on to the 6 to 12 child, she saw the critical importance of remembering that the greatest mysteries have already been shown to us through the younger child. And so I wanted to uh, mirror that in this book. And that's why I went back in chapter one to, in a sense, remember, uh, recap, remember. Um, Sophia had said the three, she had identified the three greatest religious needs and capacities of childhood. And she had listed three. And the first two are manifest before the child is six years of age. And that's the capacity for need and capacity for relationship and to celebrate that relationship. And then the second one to explore and enjoy the mystery of life itself, including the mystery of, of death. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not until level two, in what we call level two in the atrium or the six and child, six and older, that they have a new greatest need and capacity, not not that they ever abandon the first two, because that's for our whole life, but they have a new capacity for engaging in the mystery of time. Mm -hmm. So that's when the history of the kingdom of God. But I wanted to go back and and just briefly, it's quite short chapter, remember, who is this child that has shown us the most essential mysteries of our faith already. Mm -hmm. They have that beautiful aspect of that child that is younger than six. They have that ability to have that metaphysical nature. Yes. As you described it on page two, it says their ability to be simultaneously attuned to physical reality, the life of the body and the senses, as well as to the invisible the infinite, the spirit life, or what could be called the transcendent reality. Right. And in courses, level one courses, I'm always a little self-conscious when I use that word describing the child before six as very metaphysical because it has a ring of kind of academic uh, university course in metaphysics, and it's a big word. And yet it is a incredibly important characteristic of of the younger child. And, And just as you read from that quote, it's that beautiful integration of physical and spiritual that's there's such a wholeness of vitality Mm -hmm. in the younger child and it's both what makes them so um uh uh, such a, a a good match for the mystery of the kingdom of god but it also makes them such a Uh, a good candidate to enter fully into the liturgy, which is based on uh, those 
liturgical signs that are very, always have a concrete element. So that being metaphysical is very important. Because they're able to be able to to both see and be in the physical presence. Yes. And see the physical things that are right in front of them. But they so easily can transcend that to see the meaning and the spiritual aspect beyond it. Right. They can look at that water going into the wine in the preparation of the chalice. And they don't separate themselves Mm -hmm. and remember a doctrine, but they look at it and they feel it. They experience it. That this wine representing us is, is being merging with and becoming one with that beautiful wine. And it, they don't have to separate the physical experience of seeing that happen with what it means. They're able to experience both at the same time. Yes. So as the child moves into that second plane, that 6 to 12 aged child, how does this metaphysical characteristic change or does it go away or what does it look like in that age child the child of the second plane is certainly still especially if they were formed uh, nourished if that metaphysical nature was nourished the whole point is that that metaphysical nature see us through our whole life Mm-hmm. So if if the younger child had a rich experience in that, that sensitivity to the physical is not going to vanish. Mm-hmm. It's just that there is a new capacity of the imagination which takes prevalence. Their imagination can now imagine time and past and present and future. So in a sense... They, they move from being hypersensitive to the physical world to even more sensitive to this mystery of time and so the history. But again, what I would keep stressing is that that metaphysical nature of the younger child is meant to remain with us always. Mm. So I always think of Psalm 8, right? Psalm 8, when the psalmist is, you know, in a moment of what what we would say today, being blown away by the awesomeness of creation. When I look to the heavens and I look to, he's looking, he's observing, or she is observing the marvels of creation. And that's a very um, physical stance to be open to, to pay attention, Mm -hmm. to know that this is beautiful and important. But then we also see the, the new capacity to say immediately, but what about us? To marvel then over our own um, awesome part, Mm -hmm. role, or position in this marvelous creation. And that's an adult. That's what we all hope that we retain is that ability to notice, appreciate, fully enjoy creation, God's first statement of who God is, and at the same time to interpret or to read those signs and know their transcendent meaning for us. I think it's a gift for us to work with children whether it's our own children or grandchildren or children in our lives or children in our atria, because they are able to do that so easily, especially that level one child, that first plain child. When we are around them, it's almost like they remind us Mm -hmm. of that metaphysical nature that's inside of us. They remind us of how to see the physical and transcend it to see the gift. This past weekend, my youngest, who's about 18 months old, he was just fascinated with bubbles. Mm -hmm. Like the other kids would blow the bubbles and he was just the happiest in the world to be watching the bubbles. And I was thinking, when was the last time I was that excited about bubbles? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Or, Or anything, not just bubbles, but anything. He was just so pure joy of the gift of these bubbles in his life. Yes, And that's one thing that these children, especially the youngest children, they give us when we are near them. They remind us 
Right. To look at the physical, but transcend the physical to the gift. Mm -hmm. I gave in the book um, the example of my youngest. I have three children, uh, Uh the youngest who's now 30. Um, I gave that (laughs) example of the dead bird. But my other favorite Mm -hmm. example of that metaphysical child was my second daughter, who was always said my most sensorial child. Um, she, one morning, for instance, when she was first, she was about two and a half. She was first really dressing herself and wanting, insisting on dressing herself. And Mm -hmm. she had started to pull on a a sweater, pullover sweater. And suddenly she got it on, but she started wiggling and looking very distressed. And she said, it's too spicy. (laughs) Which is what? Her way of saying it's scratchy. She felt things, sensorially experienced things very strongly. So one day we were sitting at the dining room table having lunch. She was eating a hot dog. She loved ketchup on it. And (laughs) while she's eating her hot dog with gusto, she's looking up at the picture we had on the wall of the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. She's not talking She's eating, totally engaged in consuming the hot dog. But suddenly, she says, Jesus is inside of you, you know? Mm. So for me, that was an example of that natural metaphysical nature. She's having a very earthy uh, experience of eating a hot dog. But at the same time, she's contemplating Jesus. Mm. And putting the two together, he's inside of us, you know. So they, that is an incredible gift, and we are meant to retain it. We are meant to stay in that place for our whole life. Right. At the end of the book, Life in the Vine, in the last chapter, I go back to say, why do we, as adults, as catechists, choose to remain so long with children in the atrium and each level level one level two level three each level of development gives us a re a different reason for remaining but the one that from the level one is that just as you shared that anecdote about the bubbles it is that that child is so profoundly present Mm -hmm. in creation Mm mm-hmm and at the same time, so aware of God's presence in it. So, And also in the relationship, like what you were speaking about earlier, those two great needs for the need for relationship, but also the need and capacity for the relationship to be celebrated. Yes. And one, I think that we lose sight of that being the most essential. Yes. I think it's in the next chapter that you speak about how... Let's see, it's on um, page four about how like in traditional catechesis, it's, it's brain knowledge. Yes. But the greater goal is for us to be formed as a person of faith and formation is about the whole person, not just the intellect. Yes. And they have this yes. great need for relationship. Right. When we sit next to them, we remember that essential need. We get so lost in the facts, but the children help us circle back to that essential nucleus, as you described it. Yes. That relationship and celebrating the relationship. Exactly. And that level one child, especially like you were saying, they are completely present in that. Yep. The good shepherd's calling me. I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) I think I underline that whole part on chapter four, because that's one of those moments where we're like, yes. 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 (laughs) Yes. <laughs> right. We are all called and being called by name and it's leading us into a, a deeper contemplation and enjoyment of God. And that is what we are doing. That is the most essential. Right. I always say that it the child that goes through the atrium from like three years old to twelve years old, if what they got out of all of those years is a relationship, a real relationship yes. with God, if that's the yeah. only thing they get, exactly. then we've done our job. Right. The Holy Spirit right. has done its job. And that's why I think one of the 
the most unique aspects or part of the identity of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd is recognizing that the child does lead us back to what is most alive, Mm -hmm. most important even. Mm -hmm. I think we still are part of a church, uh, universal, that still mostly thinks of little children as a sort of immature uh, dabbling in faith. Certainly, we want to teach them mm-hmm. everything we can, but they're just really, but so that as one grows, one becomes more capable of penetrating the mysteries of faith, or at least knowing all about one's faith. But in fact, it is the younger child who first brings us to the heart of the matter, and, and adults need that as much as children are good at it. We need it. Well, Rebecca, let's move into chapter two. Could you speak about the spiral method? You said that it was kind of the skeleton of how you wrote this whole book. Would you describe for us what is the spiral method? We speak about it a lot in our work. Right, right. When I was in the Rome course, Sophia mentioned it. I shared a, a, a quote that's in Religious Potential 2 um, about the spiral method. Let's see, it's on page 6. And she mentioned this in the course, but it was a brand new term for me. And so after the course, I went the class that day, I went to her and said, tell me more about the spiral method. And she had a, got this little Mona Lisa smile on her face <laughs> and said, I think you will need to figure that out hmm. as you work with children. So she didn't give me a further definition. She didn't explain it to me, but, but I knew it was very, very important. And so over the years, working with children, Mm -hmm. I kept pondering one of the original 10 characteristics of the Catechesis Mm -hmm. of the Good Shepherd was we are about the Mm de-schooling of catechesis. So what did that mean? Uh, It was further articulated in the characteristics when we said, what is the atrium? The atrium is a place of prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can't say that the classroom is a place of prayer. It's a place of learning, acquisition of knowledge, development of of intellectual skills, and so forth. But the atrium is a place of prayer. Therefore, you know right away this is a different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And and that difference is also reflected in the two terms, religious formation, religious instruction. So if it's about formation, then it's formation of of a person. Mm -hmm. And so we can never construct a plan just based on the content of our faith and when it should be imparted. Mm -hmm. We have to find, like Sophia said, and I used that quote at the beginning of the chapter, we have to find a method that is co-natural with the content Mm -hmm. and of like nature. Okay, so what is the content of our faith? We have to go to our faith. We have to say, what is the nature of our faith? And one of the first words we have to we have to acknowledge is that it's mystery. Mm -hmm. The, The mystery of God and the mystery of God's relationship with us, the mystery of God's relationship with the creation. And if, a mis- if it's a mystery, which it is, no matter how much we know about it, there is always more to know. Right. So we have to find a way to enter into that mystery and to grow in it. A method that does not change the nature of the mystery. So we, that's where we said, Catechies of the Good Shepherd, if you could only do, say one sentence about it, it's the meeting ground between the mystery of God and the mystery of the child. Mm-hmm. And right there you have 
two things about God. You have that sense of it is an ongoing unfolding. Mm -hmm. There's no limit. It's an unfathomable. We will never, until we see him, her face to face uh, in the in the parousia, will we have, will we know fully, right? So it's an unfolding thing, this, this knowledge, this experience. And no matter what we start off knowing, we are meant to grow in that knowledge and in that experience. So we have to find a method How is that going to be? It has to be a method that respects the content and the recipient. So the spiral method is that method. I I say in the chapter also, we have another method word term, which is the parable method. That's how Jesus chose to impart the greatest mysteries of the kingdom of God. And we have the term, the method of signs, which is how we speak about the liturgy. It is a method of signs where that physical element, be it the bread, the wine, the light, the water, the oil, is the means of transmitting that transcendent, infinite reality of God and God's grace. So those are powerful terms for, for our faith. But the spiral method is also important because that's the method that respects both the unfolding nature of the content, how it's alive and active, and that anything alive is marked by growth and transformation. You can't package it. You can't reduce it and package it. And it respects the mystery of the recipient, the person. Because you cannot say, be true to this mystery of God and the child, if you say, okay, all five-year-olds need to learn this. All first graders need to learn that. So this method allows you to be present to and aware of how the mystery of God unfolds from most essential to Uh, This movement from the heart of the matter, or or as the fathers of the church said, the vital nucleus. And it, 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 you know, allows you then to keep going wider and wider to understand and receive even more detail. But never will anything you discover be greater than or more important than that vital nucleus, which as you know, is what we're giving the youngest children, what Sophia also called the bud. I love that imagery of the bud that you talked about there in on page five. Yes. That you talk about the whole flower already contains everything it needs contains. in the bud. Right. And so everything that is most essential is most needed is in that right. bud. In regards to this aspect of our faith, it's all connected to that vital nucleus. And it's our job to just kind of spiral around that nucleus, that bud, to just let that bud open. Right. I mean, we can also go to that quote I used from uh, Cardinal Congor about the seed, because even before it becomes a bud, it has already been a seed. So another image image, of course, would take us back to the mustard seed. Mm -hmm. That's the best seed example because it's the smallest. Right. But within that seed, the entire tree is already contained in that most condensed, intense form, the strength of God. And what's it's a matter of growth and transformation, becoming who it is from the start. Mm-hmm. Um, so that imagery is is very powerful. And as I say in the book, it's particularly p- powerful because seeds, buds, flowers are alive. Mm-hmm. And this mystery of God is alive, growing and changing yes. just as the human person is. Mm-hmm. 
One thing that I took away from this chapter, especially on page five, page five and six, when you're referring to the vital nucleus in the bud, you speak about how we start off at the vital nucleus and we kind of spread out and spiral out from that as children have piqued interest in certain of certain aspects of these truths of our faith, but to come back to the center, to the nucleus. I've never thought of that before. I've always understood, you know, we have the nucleus and it's a starting point to spiral out from, but that we need to come back to that yes. vital nucleus again and that it's okay for us to get excited and to learn about details right. that or as we spiral out that are not necessarily essential, but we still should end up back at the nucleus. And I was kind of curious as a catechist and as a mother, should our wondering questions, should we follow that format where we start out at the essential, the nucleus, and especially the older children as we spiral out, but should we end back at that vital nucleus again? Well, I think for me, in terms of how a, how a meditation unfolds with older children, mm -hmm. I think what's it, two things happen. First of all, we start, I don't care how much experience the child has had in the atrium, we always begin with remembering. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're remembering that vital nucleus of that subject. So, for instance... With uh, the parable of the Good Shepherd, um, that's what I tried to uh, do with my little personal meditation there of giving a sample of how any given theme unfolds over uh -huh. time according to the developmental stage of the child. But we never would just immediately start speaking about his confrontation with evil mm -hmm. and as represented by the wolf. But what is the greatest news of that parable, whether you're three or 73, mm -hmm. is still Jesus has revealed to us this great secret of who he is and who we are. Mm -hmm. What is the nature of that relationship he has with us? You know, you're still going to go back. It's not the same as a review because your intent is different. Mm -hmm. In a review, your intent is to make sure the children remember the important points. But this is to re recall and enjoy with the children. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be that's going to be true uh, all the way through the three levels of the atrium. And it's why you don't have to worry if a child comes into the atrium in level three. Uh, and has never mm -hmm. been in an atrium. Right. Because whatever the theme, whatever the subject, you're going to recall. And then you'll go as far with that child as they're ready to go. They're older, so they can go further, even from the first moment. But it's the spiral method frees us from that school mentality of, oh, my goodness, this this child is nine years old and he never got the Good Shepherd presentation. I've got to go send him back to level one. And, uh, you know, you don't. You just have to know each theme and how it unfolds from most essential. And that, and that one is always coming back. So back to your question, yes, in a meditation with older children, in the end, in a sense, you return to what is most important, what is most impactful in inner life about this theme. Yeah, I love that you just lifted up that about the older child, because that's always a concern for us, especially for us as parents. We feel like, oh, we missed it. You know, like our child's 11 years old. And how do I start this with them when they're, they've already missed this? But you just gave beautiful advice about how we start at the nucleus. You start with what's most essential that you lay out that essentiality throughout this whole book. But what is most essential about this piece of the liturgy or this scripture that mm -hmm. God is revealing to us and that we should start there? Right. Right. I loved uh, 
in my own, uh, one of my favorite chapters before I wrote this book in the Bible is Isaiah 30. And I love that, you know, in verse 15, he says, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. Mm. In returning to what? You know? Mm-hmm. And to me, having done the catechesis so long, it's returning to what is most essential Uh the very things that we're lifting up and enjoying with younger children. And every time we return, this is the other uh, interesting facet, returning also propels us even further out than we've been before. It's like a trampoline. I was just with (laughs) two of my grandsons last night, and they were jumping on the trampoline having a great old time. And I thought, you know, that's also what going back, returning to the, what's most essential, that's also what happens. It it gives an energy burst mm-hmm. to continue going into further and further reaches, if that makes sense. It's almost like that is the energy source. Yes, the bud, the vital nucleus, it is the energy source for our spiritual growth. But it also makes me think about, again, us returning, what's the word that you use that returning and resting in this vital nucleus. And the children call us to that because they're already doing it. They're calling us to return and rest in that vital nucleus. And they are again, being a gift to us in our own spiritual growth. In that returning and resting, it propels us, like you said, like the trampoline in our spiritual faith. Yes. Well, these two chapters, they are so, just like the whole book, they are so concise, but they are packed full of so many gems. There's, like, for example, there's this one liner that says, a good presentation is one that is simple and essential. <laughs> it's on page six. And I highlighted that and was I was thinking, oh, gosh, that's something I need to be reminded of yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. You know, like even at the dinner table with my children, simple and essential. And that is all that is needed, that vital nucleus. Right. So it's one of the ways it's it's for most of us a complete paradigm shift. Yes. From all that we came into this thinking that Mm -hmm. education is, religious formation is, Mm -hmm. that is the most difficult discipline for adults, is knowing that less truly is more. Mm -hmm. And learning to trust the power of those few words, to trust the power Mm -hmm. of the inner teacher in the child. So the the spiral method is represents a completely different approach to religious formation. Mm -hmm. Sophia didn't invent it, but she's going back to the doctors of the church. She's going back and saying, when did we become so schoolish? So we're the adult. We're in charge of all the content. We've got to be really super good at deciding when we're going to impart this knowledge. Is it going to be first grade, second grade, third grade? You know, it's this is inviting us in to a very different discipline and and trust level. We have to know the child. We have to be trained and formed in how we understand what we're seeing in the child. And we have to dwell with these richest mysteries of faith so much that we are truly at home with only saying the most important things and trusting the silence, but more trusting the inner teacher of that child, which is the Holy Spirit, will take those most essential words and go with, go with it. They don't need us to bring lots of things to their attention. So it's, but it is a shift, a huge shift um, for us. And it's, it's worth all the work to follow this discipline. Um, It's worth it all, but it is difficult. It is challenging in the beginning for all adults. (laughs) 
It is. It is very difficult. And in your story about Sophia and your in your important question to her about what is the spiral method, she's modeling this so beautifully because she is trusting the inner teacher in you and the spiral method that as you contemplate it, yes. you will find the answer. But she didn't answer your question, you know. Just like, just like Jesus and his, in the parables, you know, he didn't directly answer the question and he trusted that we will find the answer and we will have a joyous discovery when we find the answer. And then, so you have this relationship with the spiral method because it was a process of you discovering. That's right. So when I'm giving formation courses i keep saying there is no shortcut Mm -hmm. to really coming to know each of these themes from its most essential nucleus its most vital nucleus what are the most important things and then how does it unfold and then knowing the child Um, We Mm -hmm. have to know the child through those eyes, Maria Montessori, in terms of developmentally. We have to have that roadmap in order to recognize what they're ready for, to recognize. And that, too, it happens over time, uh, that you come to know the child or feel capable of perceiving where the child is at. Mm -hmm. Um, and knowing how to make that match between mm-hmm. the content and that particular child. It's, mm-hmm. it's an ongoing journey um, that's very frustrating to some people um, because we're conditioned to want to know where we're going, when we're going there. Um, plus, as I point out in the excuse me, which I point out in the book, Um, conventional education does rely on a test. How are we, the adult, going to know if we don't verify it through a quiz or a test? And that that is an anathema to this particular work. So it calls on us to be okay with the mystery of, did that child get anything from that? Do they did they quote learn the lesson or the parable or the moment of liturgy? We don't know, and we're okay with not knowing. And then when they suddenly come out with something mm. profound, we realize it was worth the wait. We learn to trust more and more the power of that inner teacher and the child. I love that you call that a mystery. The mystery of if the child got anything, (laughs) you know, because that's how we feel. I always say that we're in the business of planting seeds, you know. Yes. You know, just like you called it a mystery. We don't know if the child got anything from whatever we just spoke about or lifted up or the time that they've spent in the atrium. You know, it's a mystery. So we have to trust the Holy Spirit. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for this book. And for coming back on the podcast to speak about these two chapters to start off our book study. They are simple, but full of so much wisdom. You're welcome. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Rebecca. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Rebecca. I want to remind you that I will have in the show notes a link to the page on our CGS USA website that has all the information to be able to do a book study on your own or with a group. I'll also have a link to buy the book, Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues, if you haven't gotten your hands on it yet. And I will also put a link to the episodes that we have already done with Rebecca about this book. My sincere hope is that each of you will gain something from these podcasts, but more importantly, from these books, and they help you draw closer to the child and to God. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.